Let me start with, uh, with uh, Peter and, uh, and uh, get uh, kind of the ion implanters history and, and see, see how, how ion implanters came about. So your history, your history with the industry goes back to, uh, back to quite a while. You, you were uh, basically working on ion implantation technology and accelerators before that already in 50s and 60s. Yes, uh, I was at a company called High Voltage Engineering and that was one of the first high-tech companies to spawn from MIT after World War II. And I joined that company in 56. But we didn't, of course, have any uh, inkling of ion implantation or semiconductors for that matter. We were nuclear physicists, or thought we were. And so we built what we called Van de Graaff accelerators. Van de Graaff was one of these famous people who invented these machines. And we must have shipped them to almost every lab in the world. In Bell Labs, for example, um, Hughes have them, and uh, many other places. And from that, towards the end of my life at High Voltage, I, well, High Voltage got requested to build iron implanters by various people. And I, and I was already, I'd moved over, I'd become president of a subsidiary called Iron Physics, and I had a research lab. I got terribly frustrated because High Voltage never responded to the customer's requests. So I think it took us six weeks to design and build the first implanter that at least we built, because we had all the bits lying around in the research lab. And then nothing happened for quite a while until I felt high voltage and my a subsidiary I was president of were going nowhere, and I decided to leave and start Extreon. So, so Extreon was really the, the first commercial attempt from uh, your, your part to, to, to get uh, ion implantation and, and uh, diffusion, doping? Well, it was very fortunate that um, I had the opportunity. Nuclear physics was ceasing to be of great, uh, it wasn't being funded, and all the funding was government money. And when the government stops funding things, it's a disaster. So there were lots of physicists all over the world who will soon be out of a job. So it's very lucky the semiconductor industry came along to absorb them. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was one of them. Okay. So what do you, what do you consider the key, key technologi technological breakthroughs on, the, on ion implantation to really become a mainstream uh, into the manufacturing technology and really adopted by the semiconductor well, manufacturers? You're really asking the wrong person a very good question. You see, I um, was an accelerator physicist, so I knew how to design and build an iron implanter. I also was able to go and talk to people who might want to buy them, who said what characteristics they wanted. But, of course, I knew nothing about how they were going to use them, except there were these things called wafers. And when we started, by the way, the first companies we went to wanted us to process broken wafers. You can imagine what a mess that was. And the wafers were one, and one inch for most people. And of course, IBM actually was one and a quarter, then okay. two and a quarter, <laughs> yeah. then three and a quarter, and then finally they got smart and went with everybody else. Okay. Okay. So then, uh, the early days of uh, Extreon, uh, were you selling in US, US only, or, no, or did you almost have immediately. a. I had some Japanese contacts because High Voltage did sell to Japan. And so we were contacted by Marabeni, a trading company that uh, dealt with High Voltage, and they wanted to sell our iron planters. Mm -hmm. So I was off to Japan in 1971, I'm quite sure. And I, for many years, I never stopped going there, more than, I think, four times a year or something like that. OK, OK. And, uh, and then, uh, on, uh, on the later on your career, you were also part of forming, uh, forming Nova, I understand. How did uh, well, that, that came about? Well, that came about for, I say, personal reasons. Uh, after Varian had acquired Extreon, I couldn't get along with Varian's management. I might have got along with the new management, but I couldn't get along with the old management. And so I decided to leave and start another company. 
and you found it then Nova. Then I shot it Nova. No. And uh, and uh, Extreon is still still uh, Varian is still supplying supplying ion Well, I, I will say that when we started Nova, we gave Extreon a hard time while we were there, and um, I'm glad to see that after we left, that Extreon has recovered. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and then uh, then Nova uh, was uh, also became uh, Ethan, and today is a company called Excelis. So That's so right. all of these companies have a very rich histories going back to back to your work and, uh, and, and what was going on in the early days of ion implantation. Uh, in terms of the, the, the technology, uh, some of the comments also on, on, a, on a breakthroughs of ion implantation was that uh, at some point uh, the, uh, the industry understood that the, the implant, the crystal damage could be annealed. Did that uh, affect and what time, what time frames this, this understanding became? Well, that was understood. Um, just before we started Extreon, that would be, I'd say, in the 60s, that uh, the, the anneal was discovered to be the all-important way of reducing the damage. I think the advantage, of course, of ion implantation, as compared with diffusion, which was what we used prior to it, was the fact that it was precise and located uh, rather definitely. It, didn't, it wasn't an exponential diffusion. Yeah. So you, where you had an edge, you had a, a boundary. And uh, then uh, I always personally considered uh, ion implanters that you, as, a, as an even operator, you needed uh, a minimum of PhD degree. Has well, it, how, do you think it has changed from, uh, from today? Well, I don't think I know many PhDs who could have run the old implanters. We used technicians, they were very good at it. But PhDs were a disaster. They always broke them. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they twiddled the knobs. Whereas the technician knew he could only turn it so far before it sparked, and okay. they didn't just do that. Okay. So um, you have to remember when people were designing semiconductor equipment in the 70s, there weren't any computers. I mean, you didn't computer control. You used rods, knobs. Very acts, if you remember those things. And um, it was, in a way, a simpler game. There was no software. Uh, you know, if something went wrong, you went to the end of the rod and tightened the set screw. So, so it was a... And in fact, the biggest advance was probably getting rid of set yeah. screws and using cotter pins. Yeah. <laughs> They discovered that in the automobile industry in about 1900, I think, when the wheels fell off. But. Yeah. So managing the factory was more than a challenge. And, and, uh... oh. Our first factory was literally a garage. And my wife remembers the period we were in it for two years because my laundry was filthy. Yeah. Because the whole place was utterly filthy. <laughs> and it flooded when it rained. We stood around this high voltage equipment with about literally an inch of water. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I don't know if our customers knew where the implanters came. It was terrible. Just on a, on a final note also, uh, a lot of the, uh, the ion implantation technology really came from the, and, and it still is in the, in the north shore of Boston. What was the, the biggest contributing factor that it's, it's all practically came from there, which today's uh, well, uh, implantation um, technology. Well, it started, well, I guess it was just because we built the companies there, that's why. That's where we lived. Yeah. Um, and in fact, we did suffer, or maybe we didn't suffer from the fact that we were isolated from Silicon Valley. I've often wondered what would have happened if we'd started the company here. My guess is there'd have been 20 startups within the second year. But luckily, we're far enough away that um, the, the technology didn't leak out quite so quickly. It's possible.